Hello and welcome to the Mind Your Career webinar series. My name is Rachel Burkhan Rammelfanger and I work with the Alumni Career Development Team here at the University of Chicago in Hyde Park. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar entitled, From Boring to Brilliant, Crafting Presentations That Stand Out from the Crowd. This webinar is part of our Young Alumni Career Development Series for Early Career Professionals, but it is the tips and the resources are useful for anyone at any point in their career. Today's speaker is Michael O'Toole, PhD 14, who coordinates the Grad Talk program at UChicago Grad. And Michael is someone who loves to learn new musical instruments. Most recently, he has started learning the ukulele. It is my pleasure to hand the controls and this presentation over to Michael. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that introduction. And thank you to all of you for uh, participating in this webinar. I really look forward to uh, receiving the questions that you'll be submitting and um, also having the chance to really share what I think is a really crucial skill in any kind of career path, and that is delivering a presentation that does not just convey information, but that also makes the audience excited and engaged and wanting to learn more. So that puts me in a difficult position that I have to engage and excite you uh, over the course of uh, the uh, 55 minutes or so. Um, but I hope that I can. And I hope that at the very least, at the end of this webinar, you have a few thoughts, a few strategies, a few concrete tips that you can take with you practice for your next presentation. Um, and I want to emphasize that idea of practicing for your next presentation. Um, good presentations don't just happen and they don't just come through having great ideas. They come through practicing, delivering those ideas, structuring those ideas, communicating those ideas in interesting ways to other people that you can practice with, whether it's colleagues or uh, or family or friends um, to continually work at the craft of presentation. So I want to start by telling you about a few of the questions that today's webinar will address. Really, there are two main questions. Each of these questions will form the basis for two parts of my presentation. The first question, what are five key factors to consider in creating presentations that engage and excite your audience? So we'll talk about five key suggestions, concrete tips to help you to not only engage your audience, but also to help them to want to learn more about what you're presenting. And the second question, is what strategies for managing anxieties about public speaking. Public speaking is notoriously difficult. It's something that people have really deep fears and anxieties about. So I also want to make sure that we talk about some ways of addressing those fears in a productive way um, and thinking about some ways uh, in which we can understand our nervousness, our anxiety about public speaking and about giving presentations, not as a negative, but as actually as a sign that we care deeply about reaching our audience. So how can we turn those anxieties into something positive? Now I want to ask you a question. So I'll have a few different online polls for uh, orient your own thoughts as we move through today's presentation. Um, so, Rachel, if you could start with question number one, uh, quality do you find most engaging in a public speaker? Um, and I'll give you uh, in the audience a few seconds to think about um, the quality that you find to be most engaging in a public speaker. Now, when you're thinking about this question, I don't want you to, to feel that you need to choose the most important or the most engaging quality, but something that you consider to be uh, one quality that you are in other public speakers and one, perhaps a quality that you aspire to really embody and, um, and have a lot of in your presentations. 
Okay, so it looks like 45%, uh, so the most uh, engaging quality that you found was enthusiasm. Um, that's a good sign for me over the course of this rest, the rest of this presentation to keep my own enthusiasm up. Um, thoughtfulness uh, received the second, uh, the second highest score, 34%. Um, that's a really important sign, I think, because it's an indication that what's important in conveying a presentation and in reaching an audience is not necessarily simply putting on a show or making everything on a surface level, but kind of thoughtfully engaging with ideas and thoughtfully engaging with how to connect with an audience. Um, it looks like the third highest score was for persuasiveness at 13%. Um, and at a slightly lower level, 4% for 30 and 5 for um, and one of the, the interesting things about this poll is that um, although enthusiasm came out on top, thoughtfulness really kind of also seemed to play a big role for many of you in what you consider to be important engaging as a speaker. Um, now, many of you might also think, well, persuasiveness is important, authority is important, humor is important, um, but perhaps not quite as uh, significant or the, the main factor as enthusiasm. Um, one of the things that I wanted to convey with um, was for us to start thinking about public speaking and delivering presentations partly as developing our style that's drawn on our own strengths as an individual and as a communicator. Um, enthusiasm doesn't have to be the only strength that we bring to a presentation. Um, the first step in really improving our skills as presenters is to think, what are our strengths as communicators, as people who want to make a connection with an audience? Um, most might think of ourselves as introspective, in which case that might seem like it might create a contrast with the idea of public speaking, which after all is about being uh, being open and extrovert, perhaps, in the way that we deliver our information. Um, but I think there are many ways in which we can incorporate ideas about introversion. Let's say maybe that introversion um, is a sign that we like to follow through an argument and think about all the intricate detail and uh, approach it from multiple different angles before we make a statement about it. And that's something that we can incorporate into our presentations as well in the structure and in the way that we communicate all of the subtle ways in which one idea presented in different forms. Um, so ultimately, it's an individual style, but I think it's important that we keep in mind that sense of conveying enthusiasm, conveying excitement for what we're presenting. One theme that will be underlying all of the tips and suggestions that I give today is thinking about the presentation as a kind of performance. Don't use this word performance in the sense of thinking of a presentation as fake. Rather, I think of a presentation as a performance because it is a type of communication that's different than everyday communication, different than the way that we mention on a regular normal basis with other individuals. And it's not just about conveying your ideas to an audience. A presentation is a performance in the sense that it involves you engaging the attention of the audience. Things like tone of voice, timing, body language, gestures, and visual aids. So if we think about it, there are many more things that create a strong presentation and create an engaging presentation than simply the ideas that we present and simply the tone of voice and expression we use to convey those ideas. Um, and we'll talk about a few of the other elements that we can bring to, to bear in creating a presentation as an effective and an attention-grabbing performance. Now, many of us might think of a presentation in this way. Um, if we think of ourselves as center with this bullhorn uh, on one side, of the screen, um, you'll see this is a kind of very confrontational way of addressing an audience. Um, and the audience is back a little bit. Um, if we think of a presentation as just conveying ideas, 
rather than actually drawing the audience in, then we might have a tendency to alienate the audience right at the beginning. But if we think of the presentation as drawing the audience in in a circle around us, um, thinking about ways in which we can create a motivation and create a reason for the audience who want to in the first place, then we can start transforming our presentational style to something that makes a connection with an audience, um, rather than simply conveying idea from one person to the next. So I want to start part one by talking about five key factors in engaging and exciting your audience. Um, and I'll start this with another poll question. Um, Rachel, if you can um, put up the poll question, how often do you get nervous about making a presentation in front of an audience? So one of the reasons why I want to start this section by ask this question of how often do you get nervous um, is to get a sense for how many of you in the audience today for this webinar um, think that nervousness or anxiety really is in the way of making connection with the audience. Um, so it's kind of roughly split into three different groups. Um, so about a third of you get nervous every time you make a presentation. A third of you get nervous most of the time, but not all of the time. Um, so for those of you who answered this question, that's a really good point for reflection in thinking when you're not nervous, what is it that you do or what are the conditions that, um, that's, that are the reason you're not nervous in that particular time? Uh, and about a third of you answer just a few times. So that's another situation for self-reflection in asking yourself, when I do get nervous, what is it that is a block for me? Um, and what is it prevents that sense of wanting a connection with the audience? Um, so I started that with uh, part one um, because the five key facts that I'm going to present to you in part one um, are all different ways of trying to think about connecting with an audience in a very strategic way, in a very goal-oriented way, and in a way where you create a plan for what you want to do in your presentation. Um, and the more that you have a plan, the more that you have a clear set of goals for reaching an audience, that's one step among a few that I'll talk about for helping reduce that nervousness and reduce that anxiety about connecting your audience. The first key factor that I want to introduce in making a connection with your audience is to not just convey information, but to motivate your audience to listen and to learn more. Now that raises the question, well, how do we motivate your audience? The first thing is to ask a few questions of yourself before every presentation that you do. The first question is the most basic one of who is your audience? If you don't know who your audience is, then you won't be able to make connections with your audience's interests, your audience's perspectives, and your audience's goals for being in that presentation at that moment. Now, there are many situations where you might not know who your audience is, or you might just have a general idea of who your audience is. In that case, I always like to of imaginary audience member who represents a kind of someone who is generally interested in what you have to say, but might be a bit skeptical about why they have to be there or what the point of them listening to you is. And if you imagine that hypothetical audience member who might be a little bit skeptical of the information you're conveying, that can help you to predict ways of engaging and ways of bringing that skeptic into your message. The second question to ask before any presentation, 
what is your audience likely to know or not to know? Um, this helps you to create a kind of baseline, a kind of ground for knowing how to tailor your perspective with the perspective of your audience. So you can get a sense for not overreaching what your audience already knows, not underestimating what your audience already knows, um, but giving everyone a sense of building from a common foundation. And the third question to ask is what connections can I make between my presentation and the knowledge and experiences of the audience? And I emphasize this word connections because I think it's through thinking about the ways in which it is to present, whether it's an analysis of a research project that you did, or a business pitch, or a representation of what your office does to a new client. Um, and only through thinking about what are the common experiences between myself and my audience that can help me to root my arguments and root my ideas in something that I share with my audience. Uh, in our case today, we all share the connection of being alumni of the University of Chicago. So if I was presenting a business pitch or if I was presenting a, um, um, a recommendation to you as clients, um, I might talk about the quad. Um, I might talk about certain buildings on campus that create a common connection of memory with you as an audience. Um, or I might talk about the Common Core, or I might talk about the Regenstein Library. Um, and all of these references to that are shared between myself and you as an audience can be ways of creating not just a sense of a connection between ideas, a sense of an emotional connection and a sense of a connection and shared experiences that can give that common ground between myself and you as an audience. But that doesn't, that doesn't lead to everything. That doesn't create all of the connections that you want to create to motivate your audience to listen, and learn more. You should never assume that your audience will automatically be interested. It's important to give them a reason to be interested right from the beginning. So what are a few ways that you can give your audience a reason to be interested right from the beginning? One is to ask a question. Um, something that be, plays around with the expectations of the audience. Something that might be unexpected, that suddenly will force the listener to pay attention. A good thing about asking general questions in the beginning of a presentation is that it asks the audience member to be involved actively in following your train of thought. If you don't ask questions, then the audience will simply feel that they are being asked to follow along. But if you ask questions, and they don't have to be questions that the audience answers, but they could be rhetorical questions. They could be questions like, you might think that University of Chicago is known for being this, but what if I told you that it was also known for this? That's a rhetorical question, not expecting the audience to answer, but it's putting you in an active framework um, and letting you know that this is creating dialogue rather than just simply a one-way presentation of information. Another way to give your audience a reason to be interested right from the beginning is to make a connection between what you're presenting and everyday life. Something that your audience might think about on a daily basis. Something that your audience might think about on a subconscious basis, uh, but you make a connection that what you're presenting will help them to see that thing in a different light. Um, a third way to grab your audience's interest is to expectations. Um, thinking about ways of framing what you have to teach them, what you want them to learn in a way that will reorient their expectation or reorient, give them a new perspective on a common question or a common thing that you're exploring. And finally, thinking about building on what the audience knows. Um, 
if you acknowledge what the audience already knows, acknowledge that toolbox that the audience has for making a connection, um, then you can use that as a kind of anchor for bringing them to a new place, uh, for introducing them to a new perspective in what you want to convey in your presentation. Second key factor that I want to talk about in crafting an engaging and exciting presentation is to create a roadmap for your audience. Now, what is a roadmap for your audience? A roadmap for your audience is a representation in the beginning, in the introduction of your presentation about where you want to take them over the course of that presentation. There can be many ways of doing this in an introduction. You can be very literal and say, for example, there are three things that I want you to learn in presentation. And the first is this, and the second is this, and the third is that. And you're creating an expectation of your audience that you have a clear idea of where you want to take them in your presentation. When you tell your audience where you're going and what they will learn, they will be more likely to follow you there. If you create an expectation, they will learn something, that they will help a question to be answered, that they will learn something about what you want to convey to them, then you can heighten their interest and heighten their attention as well. So in your introduction to any presentation, speak directly to the audience, thank the audience for being there. This is a great way to make a connection with an audience that's more than simply the information that you want to convey, but rather creating a connection that you're happy to be there, you're conveying that enthusiasm that you want to be there and you want to be creating a connection with the audience. In your introduction, state your topic and state the basic plan of your presentation clearly and directly before diving into the details. In the presentations that I see, in my work and in my work with students at the University of Chicago. This is something that seems very self-explanatory, but many people forget to give a big picture sense of what your presentation is about and to tell the audience that you have clear goals for what you want to learn and to tell the audience what their expectations for having learned something at the end of the presentation are. One way you can also create detail and vividness to your roadmap is to use verbal signposts along the course of your presentation. Verbal signposts are statements that orient your audience to your message, that orient your audience to the different sections of your presentation that you've provided that roadmap for, and that provide them with a re-motivation to listen to what you have to say. We all know that over the course of a presentation, our attention as audience members waxes and wanes according to our own sense of energy and enthusiasm in the presentation. And it's our jobs as presenters, it's my job as a presenter right now, to give you that sense of re-motivating you to listen. Um, and one way to re-motivate an audience to listen, to think about the connections that they're making and the things that they're learning, um, is to use verbal signposts. Um, now, there are a lot of different ways of incorporating verbal signposts into your presentation. Um, one example of verbal signposts are words that indicate elaboration. So rather than simply going into a little bit more detail, rather than simply elaborating on a main point that you want to convey to an audience. Tell your audience that is what you're doing. At this point in time, I want to give you a little bit more detail in the big picture that I'm trying to convey. And so with that kind of framing, with that kind of verbal signposts, I'm asking you as an audience to listen a little bit more closely. And I'm telling you that I'm going to get into the detail, and this is something that I want you to pay attention to a little bit more. Um, without those signposts, without telling the audience that now I'm going to elaborate, 
Now I'm going to transition to another section. Now I'm going to give you a summary of the main points of my presentation. It's harder for the audience to get a sense of anchoring themselves into what it is we want to convey in a presentation. So we have key factor number one, don't just tell information to your audience, but motivate them to listen and learn more. We talked about key factor number two, which is to create a roadmap for your audience. And now we want to move on to the third factor in engaging and exciting your audience, and that's providing a framework for your message. And providing a framework for your message is important in a few different ways. It's only with a framework that we can give a sense to the audience of what is important, what is not important that perhaps the audience does not have to think too deeply about, and what is it especially that we want the audience to take home from our presentation and to think about as the most memorable aspect of our presentation. What we want the audience to know in a big picture way. Now, there are a few ways to think about framing your message. Um, the most important thing about framing your message is before any presentation to think very hard about what your take home message is. Take home message is concise, not more than one or two sentences, is the summary of all of the uh, all of the findings, all of the things that you want to convey to your audience in as concise and efficient a message as possible. Think about it, if I gave a take home message that was 10 sentences long, it would be a lot harder for you to remember this message, to think about this message and to actually take it with you, remember it tomorrow or to remember a week from now when you're doing your next presentation, then if I just gave you a very simple one sentence take home. Now you might think, well, I can't possibly condense everything that I want to convey into a one sentence take home message. That's where the framework is important because the take home message is what allows you to connect details to the larger framework that you want to convey. If all of the details, let's say the five or six details about your presentation that you want people to remember are connected to that one significant take home message, then it's much more likely that your audience will understand those details, perhaps will remember a few of those details because you're making a connection to the larger framework of your take home message. A good take-home message helps your audience understand what is important about your work and how your work connects to a larger issue. Now, I want to emphasize that the take-home message helps your audience understand what is important about your work. Just as I said that you don't want to assume that your audience will naturally be interested in your presentation, you have to give them a reason to be interested. I also want to emphasize that you don't want to assume that your audience will think it's important. Because of that, you it's your responsibility to convey why it's important. And if you convey why it's important, and if you use very specific directed language, I think that you should know this. I think that this is important because in all of our careers, in all of our uh, daily lives, we communicate messages to other people, and we want to make sure that those messages are memorable and that they make an impact. Um, telling you that it's important and giving you a reason for why it's important will make it more likely that the audience will actually think that it's important and convey some of those senses of authority and impact that we want to incorporate into our presentations. So thinking a little bit practically in terms of some steps in providing a framework to your next presentation. First thing is to think about the big In any presentation that you're giving, what is the one thing that you want people to know 
and have learned by the end of that presentation. And use that as a way of connecting with the big picture that you need to share with your audience. Use the big picture to craft a one sentence takeaway message. Now you might find, well, it's really two sentences works better. Really three sentences works better. Oh no, actually uh, 10 sentences works better. Uh, thinking about the home message is exercise in condensation and concision in expansion. You can use other elements of your presentation to expand, think about the details, but it's a really good exercise to just try to fit your takeaway message into one sentence. In thinking about your presentation as a whole, one way to help with organizing the content of your presentation is to break it down into short and easily digestible modules, each of which could stand alone, which directly support your takeaway message. Now, if we think about this as a hypothetical example, um, let's say that you want to convey an idea in your presentation, and when you run through that idea, uh, it takes roughly about three minutes to convey that idea that you want to present. Now, put ourselves in the shoes of an audience member. That three minutes start to feel a little bit long by the two minutes, or by minutes and 30 minutes mark. And the longer that it feels, the more our attention might drift, and the more our attention might go towards something else or we might be distracted as an audience member. But if as a presenter, we think about that three minute message as not being one message for it to be, but rather as being three shorter messages, three chunk information that we want to convey to build up the larger impact and the larger message, then those three models, each of which might be able to stand alone, can actually help to orient the attention of the listener in a way that makes it a little bit easier to follow and a way that makes it a little bit more digestible. Um, also, from our standpoint as presenters, to convey a lot of information, thinking of the information in terms of discrete building blocks we're building up to get to create a big picture can help us to try to figure out what we want to say in the first place as well. Finally, thinking about the order of the modules. So order your modules into a narrative flow in which they follow each other and tie together into a cohesive whole. One way to think about creating this cohesive whole is to think about a presentation structure in terms of an hourglass figure. So if we think about the top of the hourglass as the beginning of the presentation, that's when we want to present the big picture framework that highlights our take home message. We're providing a sense of an anchor for the audience so that we can fill in the details and have a connection to the big picture message that we want to convey. As we get further into our presentation, that's when we want to start drawing on specific examples that highlight and support the take home message. I think in thinking about examples to highlight and support the take home message, it's important to think about and strategize for a variety the examples that shine different lights and different perspectives on the take-home message. If all of our examples seem to highlight the same thing, but in different ways, then we're not necessarily reinforcing the take-home message of our presentation. In the same way, if we provide three examples that each of them are very different kinds of examples and a big picture message in a very different kind of way. It's important not to forget in our conclusion to reinforce our take home message, to draw the lens, to draw the focus of our audience back towards that picture, um, and to really conclude in a way that highlights the take home message we want to convey. So moving on from key factor number three to frame our take home message to frame our narrative, um, I want to move to factor number four, create a dialogue with the audience. Now, there are a few ways to create a dialogue with the audience in presentation. And I want to emphasize in the beginning that I don't necessarily mean literally asking questions to the audience and expecting the audience to 
answer them. Now, it's a great presentation in the event that we can incorporate that into our presentation. But for many presentations, it's not expected that we're asking questions directly of the audience. Uh, this webinar, for example, is one where if we were meeting face-to-face -face in a physical space, then I might ask questions in a different way, incorporate them in a different way into my presentation. So looking a little bit more metaphorically about creating a dialogue with the audience, the first is bringing your audience into your message. One great way to bring your audience into your message is to ask rhetorical questions in the course of your presentation. And those rhetorical questions are ones in which you are asking the audience to engage in a certain kind of thought experiment or active involvement in what you're trying to present and in what you want to convey to an audience. Um, now there are a lot of different ways of framing those kinds of questions, um, but one example would be to start a presentation about, let's say, climate change by opening with a question. How many of you thought about the impact of your actions on the climate this morning when you took a shower? I wanted to convey certain information about climate change, let's say using statistics and using a little different kinds of analysis to convey what I want to con what I want to present about climate change. I could just present that data, present that analysis, present that statistics, and feel like my message is being conveyed. But if I ask a question, like I just did, asking you as an audience to reflect on something that you do on a daily basis that you might not think very much about how it connects with statistics or analysis of climate change. Um, but by asking that question, I've reoriented the framework that you as an audience are thinking about the data and thinking about the analysis and giving you a framework to think about the importance of that message for things that you do on a daily basis. So asking questions to bring your audience into your message is an important way to create a dialogue. Watch for feedback and adapt to it. Um, what I mean by this is I want to make eye contact with our audience when we're crafting a presentation and we notice certain things about what our audience is doing. Now in this webinar, I can't see you as an audience, so I'm not sure what you're doing. So feedback is different. I try to incorporate some online polls and adapt to your answers in the online polls. But a way of thinking about feedback is to think about what kinds of signs is the audience giving me to orient how I'm doing with the message that I'm can. If you make it, uh, a message to bring out uh, an argument in your presentation, and you know, all of a sudden, no one has really been taking notes, but all of a sudden with that particular method, suddenly people are taking notes. That's a sign to highlight, emphasize, go into more detail about what you're presenting to the audience at that particular moment. Um, noticing that your audience is starting to get a little bit tired, if you're noticing that your audience is slouching a little bit, that's a feedback sign for you to adapt, to bring in a little bit more enthusiasm into your presentation. Finally, create multiple connections with your audience. So you can create a dialogue not just through what you say, but also through what you post in the PowerPoint presentation, for example. You can post a question that you want the audience to talk about in PowerPoint that you don't necessarily need to ask literally during the course of your presentation. Um, or you can create other ways of connecting and creating a dialogue with your audience through the visuals. Perhaps you want to display a visual representation of something that you're describing verbally. And then you're connecting with your audience, not just in one mode, not just in a verbal mode, also in a visual mode. So moving on to the fifth and last key factor, that's conveying excitement in your delivery. Now, there are a lot of different ways of conveying excitement in your delivery. Um, and I wanted to ask another poll question of you. Um, and so, Rachel, if you can post poll question number two, what do you think is the best way to convey excitement in a presentation? Now, none of these 
answers are ultimately the best way. But I just want, if you had to choose between these five options, which are the ones that you would choose to convey excitement and enthusiasm? And I'm saying right now that it seems like the last option, smile and make eye contact with the audience, is coming out on top as a good way to convey excitement in a presentation. Um, emphasizing keywords and phrases is coming out as the second way to convey excitement in a presentation. Uh, a few of you thought telling the audience exactly that you're excited is a good way to convey excitement in a presentation. Um, maybe it's not the best way, um, but it is, I think, important to show the audience to, that you're excited, that you're enthusiastic about communicating with them. Um, and actually telling them is often a good way of doing that. Um, not Fewer people thought making dramatic gestures with your hands was the best way, speaking loudly and quickly. Um, of course, we want to incorporate gestures and body language into our delivery, um, but it's not the, not the only way to convey excitement. Speaking loudly and quickly might not convey excitement if it conveys instead that we're feeling rushed. One key thing that I want to emphasize in conveying excitement is that the more that you convey excitement in your presentation, the likelier the audience will feel excited about what you have to say as well. Um, a lot of facts in the way of us conveying excitement. And a big factor in hindering us from conveying that excitement is being nervous about speaking. Um, if we practice certain elements of our delivery, and that's vocal expression, tempo and timing, body language and gesture, and eye contact. These are all ways of, these are all modes in our presentation style that we can think about in very targeted ways to convey excitement in ways that go beyond simply what we're saying. Vocal expression is crucially important in conveying and in delivering our message. I often suggest to students that when you practice a presentation, think about your presentation and think about your practicing as exaggerating elements of your vocal expression. Practice saying things in a really enthusiastic way, in a way that just goes beyond what you consider to be your normal tone of voice. Now, what I just said, I might not want to incorporate from beginning to end in my presentation that might get a little bit tired. But if I practice emphasizing and exaggerating those elements of vocal expression, I do do a presentation, I can maybe find a middle ground between that exaggeration and my normal mode of speaking. Similar thing with all of the other elements of delivery. Practice, think about exaggerating them. And ask someone who's watching you, does it seem like I'm exaggerating? And sometimes the answer will be maybe just a little bit, but not very much. But I hear you, I hear you're excited and you're enthusiastic, and that's conveying excitement and making a connection with the audience. So anxieties about public speaking make it better to make connections with an audience. Glossophobia is speech anxiety or the fear of public speaking. And it's something that affects almost all of us when we are making a presentation. I want to talk about three ways to quickly address anxiety about public speaking. The first, know thyself. Specifically, write down a list of what makes you nervous about public speaking and what anxieties you encounter during a presentation. Now, there can be a lot of different things that you include in that list. It could be something that you think that is going to happen about a presentation. Maybe you think that the audience will not be interested in what you have to say. Maybe you think that the audience will think that you don't know what we're talking about. That can be part of a list. These anxieties or these fears can also be actual physical things that affect us when we present. Maybe we feel our voice becomes harder to control. It shakes a bit. Maybe we notice that we run out of breath. 
or when we make a presentation and we're scared of reaching the audience. Or maybe we know that our hand starts shaking. So write down a list of all of those things that in your reflection made you nervous about public speaking. And then create an action plan with specific actions you can take to address each item on the list. If you find difficulty controlling your voice, your voice starts shaking. An action plan can be to put a message in, let's say, at the end of each paragraph in your presentation script to breathe, to remember to breathe. And that's a specific action that you can take to help address that anxiety. It's only thinking about the specific actions that you can take that you can start to develop a plan and start to develop more comfort in addressing those fears and those anxieties that come up. The second thing, the audience is your friend. We often think about the audience as this intimidating aspect uh, on the other side. Audiences want us to succeed when we give a presentation. So how do you make the audience your friend? If you can introduce yourself to make small talk with audience members for the presentation. Find the supportive audience members as your anchors. I always like to pay attention to the people in the audience who are not along to what I'm saying, who are smiling when I am addressing them. And those are the audience members that I tend to make more eye contact with. Know that they're smiling, their attentiveness, their sense of engagement will help me to feel more engaged in what I'm presenting. And the third, draw the audience, ask questions and create dialogue. If you are nervous, then ask questions. Ask people in the audience to directly respond to your questions. And that will give you a feel that it's a community of people in dialogue and not you telling other people what to do. And finally, practice in the same way that you will present. Now, this is crucially important. Um, if you know that in your presentation you'll be standing, then when you practice, stand. If you know in your presentation that you won't have recourse to any notes, then don't use any notes in your practice. The more that you make your practice exactly the same as your presentation, the more you'll be able to address the things that hold you in your practice and create an action plan for doing things better in the actual presentation. So at this point, I want, I know that we only have a few more minutes for questions, but I'm happy to, um, um, happy to address any questions that you have about delivering effective and engaging presentations. Thank you, Michael. I have a question. Can you demonstrate for us um, a takeaway by telling us what your takeaway of today's presentation is? Yes, uh, that is a good question, one that I imagined would come up in the course of my presentation. Um, my key takeaway message for the presentation is to think about a presentation as creating a connection, an audience, based on a set of experiences you want to share with an audience, rather than thinking of a presentation as conveying information from one person to the next. That's my takeaway message. Part of my goal in this presentation is to give a specific set of actions and strategies for thinking about how to create those connections. Could you say a little bit more about using PowerPoint effectively in presenting? Yes, I can. So generally, my suggestion for using PowerPoint while presenting is that less is more. A lot of people use PowerPoint to add more information to the presentation that they don't feel that they want to address in a verbal manner. What happens when you use PowerPoint to add more information is that the attention of the gets split and the audience wants to listen to you but when you put additional information that you're not talking about on the PowerPoint then the audience is faced with a conflict I want to listen but then I also want to process this additional information on the PowerPoint and now I don't know what to do so use the PowerPoint to say so 
in your verbal presentation, if you have a complex thing you want to present, the PowerPoint, the visual, should offer a simplification of that. And use the PowerPoint to highlight your main points, not necessarily to add more points to what you need to say, but to whittle it down. If you have five things you're saying in one particular slide, the slide should only be a kind of summary of the most important about that. What about using memes or comics or videos in a PowerPoint or other presentation? It can add humor, but does it reduce professionalism? Well, that's a very good question. It's something that people worry a, a lot about in terms of balancing humor as a form of meaning connection with expectations of professionalism. Um, this, of course, is going to be different in different contexts of presentation, in different careers, and in different making a connection with an audience. Um, in most situations, a sparing sense of humor at strategic points goes along towards creating a sense of connection, and in most cases does not disrupt the sense of professionalism. Um, but I use sparing here as keyword. Um, in thinking about humor as a way of really causing the audience to think of things in a different way. Some memes can do that. Some memes take uh, a common thing that we think about and they add a different spin. And because they add a different spin, we find it funny and, and humorous. Um, if that connects with our message, then by all means use it. Um, so if it doesn't connect with the message you're trying to convey, if it just seems like trying to be funny for the sake of trying to be funny, then that's where it might be less professional. because it might seem you're letting the humor take over your message rather than letting the humor highlight and emphasize your message. One of our um, attendees says that they have a sort of visible physical reaction when they present. They, um, you know, they get a little red in the face. What might they do when they know that that might happen and it will be visible? Should they address it head on? How might they um, deal with that? Yes, that's another good question. Um, the question of addressing it head on, I think, is a good one. Um, assuming that that is something that makes you feel comfortable. Um, and that's something that you can really only know through trial and error. Um, if we put ourselves in the shoes of an audience member, of course, there are some presenters who seem to just be superstars when they're presenting not display any kind of sense of physical anxiety or physical reaction at all, and they seem confident from beginning to end. But most people are not like that. And as audience members, we know that most people are not like that as well. So I think the first thing is to know that showing a sign that you're nervous or showing a sign uh, that this is something that you care about is often something that will be perceived sympathetically by the audience, um, but to the extent that you show that you're aware of it and you show that you have taken steps to, to make sure that you still feel comfortable. Um, oftentimes simply saying, drawing attention, for example, to a shaking hand, or to a red face, uh, can be a good way of addressing that. Um, Another thing, another kind of strategy generally, I think, is to, in practicing of your presentations, to a few different things and to see the effect they might have on the particular physical symptom that you might have or the particular anxiety that you might have. Um, you might find that speaking from behind a podium um, makes you feel a little bit more comfortable, slows down your heartbeat a little bit and takes some red out of your face. Um, in which case then, before presentation, um, ask if there'll be a podium available. Try to make that particular part of your presentation. Um, it's only through practicing and it's only through trying uh, multiple ways of addressing um, what is causing you some discomfort and through trial and error, try to find ways of feeling a little bit more comfortable and making that connection with the audience. Um, 
Thank you for sharing so well about the information on generating enthusiasm. Can you elaborate on how we can prepare to increase enthusiasm on the spot as needed as a poor, at a point in the presentation where we didn't expect to? Yes. So I think that what one thing that is crucial to incorporating enthusiasm into your presentation is to develop rituals before your presentation that you know will work for you for putting yourself into the right mindset to be enthusiastic about what you're presenting. Those rituals might differ from one person to the next. Your ritual might be listening to a particular song a half hour before every presentation you do and thinking about how you want to draw on the enthusiasm from that song into your presentation. Another ritual might be finding a quiet space before your presentation and just kind of relaxing and getting uh, centered for conveying that enthusiasm. Uh, so finding rituals that help you to get into the right mindset. Also practicing enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is something that just happens and enthusiasm can sometimes the wrong way. It might seem over-rehearsed. So practices of increasing the vocal expression, the intonation, the volume range that you use, uh, practicing with other people ways of incorporating gestures to convey enthusiasm. Um, it's through that practicing with other people and trying out a few different ways of making enthusiasm a part of your delivery that you can start to get a sense for what works for you as well. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you everybody else for joining us today. This was really a wonderful presentation. We've learned so much about turning our presentations from boring to brilliant. So just thank you for that. Um, everyone who's attending, I hope you'll join us again later this month as we help you continue to build your career. We're going to have a couple of webinars on applying to medical school, to law school, or other graduate school programs. And on August 2nd, we'll have a webinar on how to nail your behavioral interview. So join us again for any of those. I hope that you'll have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Bye. Bye.